The Tempest. Prospero, legitimate Duke of Milan, has been expelled from his position by his brother and find himself on a desert island after his ship is shipwrecked. The play begins with a strong storm, unleashed by Ariel, when she guesses that her brother Antonio is traveling on a ship near the island where he is. In it, Prospero has the company of his daughter Miranda, rests with his numerous books, and dedicates himself to the study and knowledge of magic. Prospero comes into contact with spirits like Ariel. With your help, he will weave an enchantment that will allow him to begin his revenge. In the end Prospero will give up his magic, forgive his enemies, and allow the marriage between Miranda and Fernando. Analysis and Context It was performed for the first time in 1611 and had a second staging around February 1613, on the occasion of the wedding of Elizabeth Stuart, daughter of James I, with Frederick V of the Palatinate. Many parallels find their correspondence with the most outstanding personalities of the Jacobean period. Thus, the nuptial mask that Prospero creates for the enjoyment of Miranda and Ferdinando, with the divine figures of Iris, Sears, and Juno assuring a happy future, if the happy couple promised to remain chastity until after marriage, could have suited the monarch very well, well known for his disciplinary art regarding the subjects of his crown. Another fact that is reflected in the Shakespearean task is the king's interest in issues related to magic and witchcraft. These practices were considered a taboo at the time that concerned in this sense, James first sentenced to death to all those people who were under suspicion of carrying out such actions. The theme of the Tempest, then, could only manifest itself in a monarch Prospero, interested in putting an end to the curse of an old witch who was lurking about breaking into the social order of the island. The sovereign also enjoyed exhibitionism and masquerades, where a series of processions took place, stage movements, the appearance of mythological figures, songs, children dressed as Moors and Aborigines of Virginia, and many others that find their correlation with numerous passages of Shakespeare's play. As for the setting of the events, it is necessary to point them out in the atmosphere of a new era of travel and discovery. Already towards the reign of Elizabeth I, tumultuous boats undertook their journey to America. Upon arrival, the English settlers found a primitive people cloistered in a powerful society of barbaric customs, which always stood in the way of their imperialist pretensions. To all this, a large portion of adventurers and men of letters used to join the company, for purely illustrative purposes, and as a way of keeping the British crown informed of the movements of an unexplored environment. Travel books served many authors who started from the base of a pagan land, uncivilized and open to endless myths and legends that spoke of the existence of ferocious monsters and cannibals who practiced black magic to destroy the white Europeans. Who they held their domains. This is the reason why, perhaps, the Tempest knew how to adapt to the intrigues of the moment and thus differentiate itself from the rest of Shakespeare's dramatic production. The role of slavery and the domination exercised by the colonizers over the lands they discovered was translated into the world of theater and, of course, into the universe of Shakespeare. Given the imminent situation of a country that sought to spread its wings and compete with the Spanish Empire, the gain and usufruct of American lands was presented as the best option for the British monarchist pretensions. In literary creation, on the other hand, this era of discoveries and appropriations gave rise to alternate dimensions, haunted islands, terrible cannibals, indomitable beasts and exotic landscapes that contrasted with those of Great Britain. La Tempested, although it is not alien to the historical moment in which it was compassed, does not fit in its entirety with the paradigm of the time. Its plot, structure and characters are confusing, giving rise to a large number of interpretations by traditional critics. In his book Repositioning Shakespeare, Thomas Cartelli presents a synthesis of hypotheses that underlie literary production and seek their correspondence with the ideology of the moment. In other words, rather than focusing on the study of Shakespeare's work, what is considered is the use of the text in its discursive function with another of a different semblance. Cartelli maintains that in The Tempest the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized is presented, with Prospero and Caliban as their respective icons. For Ngugi Wathyango, no text can be considered isolated from the environment that has inspired it and, consequently, from the influence it has had on cultural discourse. In 1898, Ruben Dario leaned towards the indigenous in his work The Triumph of Caliban to denounce the materialistic barbarity of the United States. The Uruguayan Jose Enrique Rodo, in an essay entitled Ariel, identified this character with refinement, art, and beauty, as opposed to the North American materialistic life symbolized by Caliban. Ariel was linked to Ibero-American spirituality and Caliban to the northern expansionist impulse of the 20th century. In 1969, 
three Caribbean authors alluded to the tempest in an attempt to circumvent its Eurocentrism. A review of Prospero in this aspect brings us to an enlightened European, rational and cold in his strategies of conquest. Caliban is also Africa, Sycorax's native land, is the terrain in which the analysis of Caliban has been addressed the most. The Ugandan Taban Lo Leong pointed to the issue of language as an instrument to make himself understood by the colonized and to control him, vision shared by the novelist George Lamming. The Feminist Academy focused on the analysis of Miranda as an instrument of the settler man to capture the attention of the aborigine and subject him to his power. The possibility of a negotiation between Prospero and Caliban to exercise control over the only woman on the island is also kept open. Clarable's marriage, reduced to the wasteland of silence, with the King of Tunis returns to take up the issue of the female figure as an object of political and commercial transaction, something very recurrent in almost all of Shakespeare's works. Criticism of this playwright's publications is, once again, very broad and open to speculation and points of view that will vary over time and the social eye that focuses on them. Magic and the supernatural. The fundamental factor with which Shakespeare configures the atmosphere of the eye, the tricks and the captivating music from Ariel, references to the witch Sycorax or mother of Caliban. Magic is the tool through which Prospero exercises his power. Even so, eventually Prospero will give up his supernatural powers. Without making it clear why, the audience can assume that it is because he has already recovered the dukedom that was stolen from him, even his daughter will be queen of Naples. Therefore, you won't need magic to wield your power. The island of the work is often associated with the islands of Bermuda. This is quite likely because in the 17th century the English ship Sea Venture was shipwrecked in the waters of Bermuda and the survivors were forced to live on those islands. The similarities that some critics have found between the story of William Strachey, one of the survivors of the shipwreck, and Shakespeare's work have led them to conclude that the latter influenced Shakespeare in the description of the shipwreck and the island. The Storm and the New World. This work was written when the British colonization of North America began. This is constantly observed in the work. One of his critical readings sees Caliban as the colonized and enslaved Amerindian. The one who is deprived of his land and imposed a foreign language. It is this parallelism that this character suggests that provokes very different reactions in the audience, depending on the time in which it has been interpreted. Although, today, the audience tends to sympathize with Caliban due to the unfair mistreatment he suffers, it is very difficult that the same thing happened to the audience that Shakespeare had in his time. So the English had a very different image of the Indian peoples. It was common to see Amerindians as primitive savages, little more than animals. Despite this change of appreciation in the public, this has not caused a rejection of the work in the audience, but new interpretations of it. In addition, the settlement of the first colonies aroused a literary concern in authors such as Thomas More or Montaigne. Such as the example of Utopia, where More describes an ideal society. Gonzalo yearns for these same ideas of Moro in The Tempest, when he tells his traveling companions what he would do if he were king. Luis Estrana Marin, in the prologue to the complete works of William Shakespeare published by Aguilar, mentions the clearly American Indian environment of the island and offers an explanation of the names of Sebastian and Miranda. According to Estrana Marin, Shakespeare must have known some of the stories that were circulating in the mid-16th century about the kidnapping by a Timbu cacique in 1526 of Lucia Miranda, wife of Captain Sebastian Hurtado, in Sancti Spiritu, one of the first establishments Spaniards in the Rio de la Plata. He also adds that Caliban speaks of Satibos, the god of his mother, who is described in the Voyages of Magellan as the greatest devil of the Patagonians. Shakespeare was able to read the original book, or even in English, where other Spanish names such as Ferdinando, Sebastian, Alonso, and Gonzalez appear. Prospero's pardon. Prospero's final decision to forgive his enemies breaks the dramatic tension of the play, providing a romantic ending. Considering Prospero's control over everything that happens on the island, this unexpected change causes the audience to wonder if this seeming change in Prospero was also planned and everything he has done has been nothing more than play with the castaways. It is also not clear why he forgives them. Some have claimed that Shakespeare was a Catholic, justifying it with the last line of his epilogue. In the epilogue, in which Prospero addresses only the public and says goodbye to the audience, he will say, let your indulgence set me free, asking the public for their indulgence in order to be acquitted. Something that was typical of the Catholic tradition, 